Den's newest and youngest star went from being a penniless university dropout to a millionaire by the time he was just 23. He describes himself as the happy, sexy millionaire. No wonder he's now a hit podcaster with a list of high-profile guests desperate to be interviewed by him. Stephen, welcome back. It's lovely to have you here with us this morning. What's interesting, you've had all of this success, but you say originally your relationship with money and finance was quite unhealthy. It was, um, and that's actually in part one. My book is called Happy, Sexy Millionaire. I don't think I've ever described myself as one, but but I, I that kind of... I'm sure someone has yeah, somewhere. Let's go with it. That story swept me away now. But, um, yeah, I, I had a... I was deeply insecure as a child and in our house we didn't have money so within me I thought that that was the cure of everything as people yeah. often do. I thought it would stop my parents arguing with each other, it would stop the shame that I had going to school and being the only kid that didn't have really nice things and, our, and, and it would make the house that we lived in not like run down. Mm -hmm. So I, I, off I went into the world pursuit trying to be this happy sexy millionaire because I thought that would be the cure of all my problems. So. I see. And so when, see. at Got what it. point did you think or does it, in fact, because people say money can't buy you happiness, money can't buy you love, money can't buy you, all sorts of things that money can't buy you. Mm. Um, at what point did you realise that actually um, this, is, this could be a healthy thing for me? This would, the, the, what, earning this amount of money, working this hard, is going to change my perception of what life was like back then. So I have to acknowledge like, my privilege, because it's incredibly easy for, for someone to say money can't make you happy, but I've also had no money and been stealing Chicago Town pizzas to feed myself, and I'd much rather have money. So I think it's important to acknowledge that life is much easier, the fundamentals of life are much, much easier when you do have resources at play. But the, the thing I thought, which I was incorrect about, was that money would scale my happiness forever. So if I had a million pounds, I'd be, at, you know, I'd be at 100 happy. If I had 2 million, I'd be 200 happy, and that would continue. What tends to happen, happen and what the data shows is that beyond a certain point, it doesn't move the fundamental kind of Maslowian mm. levers of, of your life in terms of fulfillment. Things like meaningful connection do, um, doing work that is enjoyable and meaningful to you does, um, and a lot of other things matter. So and what does I was the research wrong. say is, to, is, is the point where that, that tips then? How, roughly, what, how many millions? Roughly, and it de obviously depends on geographies, but roughly, I think it's about 75,000 a household, where, where beyond that point, your happiness doesn't um, g g make huge upward gains oh, beyond right. that point. So. What um, it was interesting was that when you were younger, something that was really, really important to you was books and yeah. reading and that escapism that that bought? Yeah, well I, well, I grew up in a house where my mother, who was our, my predominant caregiver, couldn't read or write. So right. um, she had four children and, you know, we, we had books in the home, but she couldn't read them herself. Oh. So what would often happen is my mum would just get encyclopedias and put them in front of me and say, copy it, copy out the encyclopedia. So I'd copy it out and then I'd call my dad, who lived in London, which was about four hours away, and I'd tell him, I've just learnt this new amazing word. And... Although my mother couldn't read or write, when you look at how those four children turned out, you've got a lawyer, um, my brother who's a super genius that went to LSE, you've got me and my other brother who's a smart, smarter than all of us, wow. um, who are all very sort of articulate and um, we have a good relationship with, with literacy, um, but it just goes to show that the role that books can play. Mm -hmm. um, so when did, when did you read your first book? Oh, gosh. Um, it would have been super young and it would have been probably something like Harry Potter that my brother had just left on the side. And this goes to the point about, you know, um, having books in the home and the importance of it, because when... But this was kind of pre-internet. This was when you picked up the phone and go... <laughs> you know? So I'd pick up things on the side, as we do, and I'd play with them. And there was one of those things was books, because we had them in our home. So it would have been... I probably would have been about six or seven, I think. And so what's important here on this campaign that you've got involved in is that quite a lot of us take having books in the home for granted, and there's an yeah. awful lot of households up and down the country that that's just not the case for children. Yeah, when, when Aldi approached me about the campaign, which is called My Reading Journey, they, I looked through the data, and about... I think there's about just over 400,000 kids that do not have a single book in their house in the UK, which is one in 17. It means that if you go into a classroom, several children in that classroom, when they go home, won't have any books in their house whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And to me, that is such a, such a crime against our society mm -hmm. because I, I reflect on the impact that books had on me, not just in terms of educating me, but in terms of escapism, in terms of me forming a relationship and an affinity and a familiarity with what a book is mm. for the rest of my life. Because I'm telling you, before the age of 10, if you don't encounter books frequently in the home, you're not going to be picking them up in your, in your 20s and mm. 30s and 40s. You just won't have a relationship with them. So I set about with Marcus Rashford to try and do something about that. Mm. So what is it that you're going to do? So Aldi are giving 100,000 books um, to children this summer 
who don't have books in their homes. But we're also calling for society to, to join us in, in donating. So you can go to aldi.co.uk slash donate books. And five pounds puts two books into the home of a child that doesn't have any books in their home whatsoever. So it's a very simple thing you can no, do that. That's a great idea. Well done. Very good. Oh, well, you. good luck with that. Um, what you don't need any luck with at all is the podcast, because that is going great guns, isn't it? You've got the diary of a CAO. Um, the guests that you've had on them, and you had Matt Hancock, who was, I think it was his first proper chat just after he stepped down as health secretary. So we know there was that kind of awkward transition. Uh, and you spoke to him then. He seemed to be very open and discussing, you know, the fact that he was in love and We'd never heard that from him before. Well, I think it's just a prerequisite if you're going to come on, on my show. And I, I'm very clear with guests that you leave all of that, st all the PR stuff, even your suit, all of that stuff. Don't bring it here. You're doing this in my kitchen at the mm. end of the day. It's genuinely recorded in my kitchen um, with, with Jack, who records the show with me. Yeah. And it's a place for honesty. It's a place for deep context. And it's a place for those unfiltered, raw conversations that we just don't have enough of anymore. Yeah. And that I genuinely just love. Now, That's you say it's raw and unfiltered. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, and I think we don't. We, we, I, the reason why podcasts generally are doing really well, I think, is because they allow for greater context, and they're not edited and they're they're not filtered. And and I think the reason why guests choose to come and have these kind of conversations with me is because it is a safe space. I'm going to ask you questions, and I'm going to ask you all of the questions that I feel I need to ask you. But I'm going to let you speak. Mm. And it's interesting that the reason when we ask our audience why they like listening to the podcast, um, which is this month we'll do about 10 million downloads. It's for all the very reasons that I often get criticised from mainstream media for doing the podcast. It's because I let people speak. It's because it's long form. It's because um, I, will, I, will be, I think I'll be relatively fair and I'll try and approach a situation without a gotcha mm. moment. And I think um, there's clearly a demand for that and we're seeing that all around the world. So media is changing because... But if you let the people... Because it could be between one hour, it could be three hours. Yeah, yeah. If you let people talk like that, you're going to get a gotcha moment eventually, and you know that. A gotcha moment? Yeah, the moment where you think, I can't believe you just said that, but that's, that's going to sell the podcast. I think if we sat here and spoke for four hours, <laughs> which is often the case, I'm reflecting on the last podcast I did, and it was four hours long. It, it might become three and a half hours because we might trim me out of it a little bit, but it's four hours long. We're going to talk about a lot of things, but the thing is, gotcha moments are, typically happen when there's not context. With me, there's full context. So any point that I make might be a six minute or seven minute point. If you were to do it in another medium, you might say 20 lines, they might pick one and that mm, might become the story. I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I think that's why people are, uh, feel safer in that environment. Mm. Or do it live. And then or do it live, live and then you, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and overrun good. like we do, which <laughs> oh, is what we're doing now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You're back on Dragon's Den doing another series? Yeah, it's been I mean, amazing. It was a dream. I filmed it now and I, oh, it's just the biggest dream, the biggest honour. I've watched it since I was 12 and sitting between Deborah and Peter is still a, uh, a surreal. I feel like I stepped into the screen. I, I genuinely know, have. I well, you're surreal. brilliant on it. You really Thank are. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good Thanks to see you. Thanks for coming here today.